and uh, when he went down to uh, the reunion, and like I say, then I saw him like a day or two after he got back and noticed he was wearing some T-shirt, and he never wore just a T-shirt. He told me it was a gray T-shirt with a white emblem on the front, and it said, Eubanks University. They were giving them out at the reunion, and you know, my kids had them made, and blah, blah, blah. How interesting. And so w- what was it that uh, that led you all to believe that Lester might have been there? Most said that he got to see his son that day, the day of the reunion. I don't know if it was at the reunion, but she said the day of the reunion, south of Ohio. Oh, I see. And so he had traveled somewhere out of town. Uh, did you think it was in Ohio or maybe in Kentucky? No, they said south of Ohio, so I just wasn't sure. I know he didn't really drive himself long distances, and he went by himself, so I don't think it was real far south because he wasn't gone. He wasn't gone that long. Daniel believes that was not the only time Lester came back. There were indications Lester had returned the following year to attend a small family gathering around the time Mose died. Daniel never saw Lester, but said the family met in private, and on the door they placed a sign. It said, Taking No Visitors Today. I wondered what all this meant about Lester's whereabouts today. If you if you had to guess, do you think Lester is still living out somewhere in, in the U.S., still free? Yes, I believe he is, at least the last I had known back in, you know, when the river passed. Um, I, yeah, I mean, he's definitely out in the U.S., but it's in the eastern side of the U.S. and probably a little bit south of Ohio, because he, yeah, he told his kids not to you know, not to have him come into Ohio. Do you think that anybody in his family would ever turn Lester in? I'll bet you if there was $100,000 on the table, I could bring him in. If he hasn't passed in the last, you know, six, eight years or so, then he's definitely still in the States. After all those years spent with Mose, Daniel said he was clear about one thing. Right or wrong... Mose instilled in his children a deep sense of loyalty to his one wayward son, Lester. I'm sure, yeah, Mose had a way of uh, trying to get people to, you know, believe his point of view or pressuring them into thinking certain ways, and I'm sure he did that with his daughter and son. And I mean, that way, of, and that way of thinking would be would be what? What is Moses thinking on all that? Well, that it's, it's family and that you protect family. These are the small steps forward in an investigation that is grinding ahead. Deputy Marshal Seiler is painfully aware that the man he's trying to find is in his mid-70s now, and the window for him to make an arrest will not stay open forever. There have been moments shadowing him on this manhunt, where I've seen signs of that pressure. On one outing, Seiler had hopes that a distant relative of Lester's would have new information, but she had unexpectedly left town. I watched him return to his car with a grimace on his face. We just didn't get a chance to meet the one person we came to talk to, which is the story of my life. It's the story of our life, man. Strike out! Damn it. But Siler does not hold on to that frustration for long. Here's what he told me after he knocked on another series of doors, all dead ends. It, it just takes the energy and the, <laughs> the energy to drive, which all my friends say, yeah, he's got plenty of energy. Yeah. <laughs> you have that never quit mindset. If you don't have that never quit mindset, you're never going to... Like, this job is just too hard. And you see, we we're just trying to contact three simple people. Just didn't work out today. So we'll start back tomorrow. 
As painful as it can be to hit a series of roadblocks, Siler told me he's content to keep hunting. It's my niche. Um, it takes someone, you know, whether um, the ability to focus for a long period of time to, to take in a lot of information and spew it out. Um, but I love it. It's like to catch those who are uncatchable. It's kind of a challenge. This guy's uncatchable. Okay. Is, that's the challenge that I face every day. And every day I come in and I know I'm going to fail. You know, every day you're going to face failure. Every day that I come to work, the chances of me catching this guy who's been on the run for this long are very slim. But that's, a, that's what I'm willing to fight. And I'm thankful that my boss allows me to do that because we have struck gold a couple of times with some really, really old cases. The passion to solve this case has been contagious inside the U.S. Marshals Service. This has been evident since the day I first got a call from Siler's boss, U.S. Marshal Pete Elliott. He wanted Lester's story to reach a wide national audience. He told me this was one of the toughest manhunts his office has ever undertaken. He follows every development and feels every moment of the case personally. Well, success is going from failure to failure with great enthusiasm, right? So even though uh, we have not got him uh, in a while, obviously, uh, since we started working this investigation, we are going to get him. We are optimistic we are going to get him. we got the best investigators in the world on this. I am 100% confident that we are going to find Lester Eubanks and we are going to bring him into custody. And he told me, that's where the public comes in. He wants to know if you have seen this man. More than likely, you know, Lester Eubanks is going by a different name. He's in a different part of the country, in a different area. He may, he may be blended in somewhere as your next door neighbor. Um, look for the little things that could add up. Look for those little things that is, you know, may cause you to be a little skeptical about the person living right next to you. Myrtle Carter says... She is always on the lookout for Lester. While she doesn't spend a lot of time ruminating about this case, she says she and Mary Ellen will only truly have peace with Lester back in handcuffs. Pam Bouts from the cemetery had been hard at work arranging for Mary Ellen to finally be properly remembered. It was the least the Mansfield community could do for a family so badly let down when Lester Eubanks was allowed to walk free. Her family can know that forever anybody could find her, that she is marked. Her life was not, um, it was not unmarked, I guess. You know, she made a mark on this earth. On a cool spring day, we watched from the fence line as Myrtle Carter came to the cemetery to see the stone for the first time. She looked stoic and stood silently, staring down at the new marker for her sister. Later, we spoke with her by phone about that somber moment. You know, all the, I don't pull up all that emotions and stuff. I don't allow it to come up because I can't live in that moment. So I don't you know, get, uh, allow sorrow and uh, all that to even visit me. Myrtle's thinking has not changed since she wrote that letter to the local paper so many years ago. As long as her convicted murderer is free, her soul cannot be at rest. Pam had asked Myrtle what message should be etched into the gravestone. Her response said everything. Next to the image of an angel, it reads, Gone Too Soon. We hope this will not be the end of this story. If you know anything that could help the U.S. Marshals catch Lester Eubanks, call them at their hotline, 1-866-4WANTED and let them know if you have seen this.
man. Thank you for listening. We've compiled photos of Lester Eubanks, including an age progression sketch showing what the U.S. Marshals believe he may look like today on abcnews.com slash this man. You can also find a lot of additional content on the case there, and we'll be updating the page as news warrants. If you haven't already, subscribe to this podcast and give us a rating and a review. Have You Seen This Man is a production of the ABC News Investigative Unit and ABC Audio. Written and reported by senior investigative producer Matthew Mosk. Additional reporting by producer Alex Hosenball and associate producer Jin Sol Jung. Production by Susie Liu. Special thanks to Josh Cohan, Lauren Efron, and Stacia Deshishku. Cindy Galley is our chief of investigative projects. Chris Vlasto is senior executive producer. I'm Sunny Hostin. <laughs> <laughs>